Thank you. Um, that's a hard act to follow. Those guys were great. I, uh, my name is Joseph Graves, and I'm an actor, writer, director, and I'm the artistic director of Peking University's Institute of World Theater and Film. And what that institute does, we have a threefold mission. I produce a lot of professional plays in China, often mixing Eastern and Western theater artists and technicians. So often we'll have English and Putonghua being spoken on the same time at stage. And then I uh, take a lot of plays from China to other countries, and I bring a lot of plays from other countries to China. And then the third uh, mission of this institute that uh, I run is to help uh, establish performing arts departments in uh, Chinese universities. We have several really wonderful training schools for actors and directors in China, but higher education in general doesn't have what we have in the West, which are uh, performing arts departments uh, geared to not only to train actors and writers and directors, and not even necessarily for that, but to sort of expose uh, all uh, students to a creative way of thinking, a creative experience, not only with the theater, but also with music and dance and those kinds of things. And about 11 years ago, to direct a Shakespeare play. Most of my life has been spent in the theater working with Shakespeare, although I've directed every kind of play that you can think of, musicals and operas and comedies and dramas, but a, a large par a portion of my um, theater life has been spent working on Shakespeare's plays. And when I was here, I met a man named uh, Chen Zhaoshan, who's the dean of the School of Foreign Languages at Beida. And he asked me to come and work with his uh, students. He told me that he had been teaching uh, Shakespeare for 25 years, but he felt he had never done it right because he really didn't know uh, anything about acting and performance. And he asked me, if, while I was here in China, if I would conduct a workshop with his students. And I, I had never worked with students in my life since I was a student a hundred years ago. And <laughs> that's not funny. Uh, he, so I said, sure, well, why don't we just do a play with the students? And I chose the, uh, Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. And I went to Beda with him, and we posted a notice on, a, on Beda's uh, school website, and 4,000 kids came to audition for the play. That play has 20 characters in it. So I was able to interview about 800 of those kids and put 80 of them in the play. We had lots of sailors and fairies and this kind of thing added. That experience was so uh, just sort of life-changing to me because none of these students had ever been in a play most of them had never even seen a play, let alone a Shakespeare play, and they were speaking um, English as a second language and then Shakespeare in English, which is sort of a third language, really. And they were uh, so uh, passionate and intelligent, and many of them were uh, innately gifted, very talented, and didn't realize they were talented because my whole life had been spent in the professional theater all over the world in London and New York and Los Angeles and Paris and Germany and oftentimes um, professional actors can get very jaded and it becomes very much like a business and it's very easy to lose the passion that many of us got into the theater uh, for to begin with which is to communicate with an audience in, in live theater performance in a way that, that no other experience really uh, offers. But the students that I was working with, that's what they wanted. And they, 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 they were so good and they were so uh, dedicated and the experience was so moving to me that I, I came back and have been trying my best to become Chinese as much as I can since then. And uh, so that Shakespearean experience changed my life. I'm going to tell you about another Shakespearean experience that changed my life earlier, much earlier, about 50 years ago. The first time that I met Shakespeare, or was introduced to him. In order to do that, I need you to use your imagination. 
And I want you to imagine that we're uh, in a British boys' school. I was born in England, but my parents were Americans, and I lived in England for a number of years. And that's where I started the school, and it's where I first met Shakespeare. So I want you to imagine that this chair is a student's desk. That's the complete works of Shakespeare. This is a teacher's desk. And now I'm going to perform for you a few minutes what it felt like to me the very first day that I was introduced to Shakespeare in England a long, long time ago. Twas breeling and the slithy toe.
Did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borgos and the mome wraths outgrabe. <gasps> Beware the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware the jujube bird and shun the frumious bandersnatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. Long time the mansome foe he sought. Then rested he by the tum-tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in uffish thought he stood, the Jabberwock, with eyes of flame, came hoofling through the tolgy wood and burbled as he came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went snicker-snack. He left it dead, and with its head, he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the Jabberwock? Oh, come to my arms, my beamish boy. Oh, frabjous day, caloocle. He chortled in his joy. Twas breeling and the sly they toves. Did gyre and gimble in the wave. All mimsy were the borogoves and the momrass outgrabe. Isn't Shakespeare wonderful, young masters all? Isn't he simply divine? That was my first introduction to Shakespeare. Although, not a word of what you just heard was from Shakespeare's writings. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know. I was six years old, six, and in private boys' school in Chelsea, a section of London, England. I and 17 other wildly confused and more than a little terrified boys entering Chelsea Special Training School for Boys were being assaulted by the teaching styles of headmaster Clive T. Revell. Uh, the a T stood for totally incomprehensible. And this, on our very first day of school. Uh, some uh, months later, we came to discover that the thing headmaster Revell had been uh, quoting from at the beginning of the class was from Lewis Carroll's Alice Through the Looking Glass. Now, uh, headmaster Revell didn't care to explain that to us at that time. In fact, uh, over the next two years at Chelsea Special Training School for Boys, we discovered that Headmaster Ravel worshipped Shakespeare so much that he felt that anyone who had written after Shakespeare had really only stolen from him. And therefore, anything of worth written in the English language from Shakespeare's time to the present was truly Shakespeare's own. Uh, Headmaster Ravel was what... Uh, George Bernard Shaw had some years earlier referred to as a bardolator. That is one who looks at Shakespeare's writings with, well, a kind of religious fanaticism, an idol worshiper. And uh, Headmaster Ravel, we discovered, had two such idols, Shakespeare and alcohol. Uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go back and finish my first day at Chelsea Special Training School for Boys as Headmaster Ravel continued his blitzkrieg on Shakespeare. Now, my young gentlemen, and you will, by the by, ever remain young gentlemen, both in your attitudes and actions, and not only in this class, but in your matriculation on the whole at Chelsea Special Training School for Boys. Never! Forget that. Now, my young masters all, these are indeed thrilling linguistic times in which to be a student of Shakespearean language. With that in mind, 
and all of you, my incipient young scholars, no doubt trembling in eager belletristic anticipation of what I am about to bestow upon you, let us launch bravely forth, sails catching the mnemonic winds of poetry upon the heady rhetorical ocean of proper Shakespearean pronunciation. Are there any questions? I, trembling in terror, and ever so slowly inched my hand upward. My shaking little digits immediately caught the loquacious hawk-like eye of Headmaster Rebel. Oh, a question from a young, interested scholar. Oh, nothing more thrilling to me than a young mind bursting with curiosity regarding Shakespeare and his speech.
he approached me with a smile, bent forward, and with gentle interest asked, What is your name, young man? Uh, Joseph Graves, sir. And, uh, Master Graves, what is your Shakespearean question? <laughs> May I please go to the toilet? <laughs> now, at this point, Headmaster Ravel's face turned an immediate tomato red. Uh, the veins on his neck and forehead stood out. He began to shake and tremble like some enormous human volcano. Well, he seemed to be trying to speak, to say something. But all that came out was a sort of a rising and falling echolalia of inflection, which finally and frighteningly erupted into a window-shattering... What did you say, young man? I... I, 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 I need to go to the loo. May I? Indeed you may not, Master Graves. And then he stood straight up and straightening his recently knotted face into something he wished to pass for a pleasant smile, but which in fact bore a striking resemblance to the insidious leers of Nazi guards at Dachau and Auschwitz. He said with a sort of impending calmness, No. My young masters all, if you learn nothing else under my tutelage, you will learn that the demands of studying the greatest writer, thinker, poet of all time, Mr. William Shakespeare, are such that they require one to ever keep under one's control one's bladder and bowels. Or to put it more succinctly, there will be no, I repeat, no going to the toilet during the study of Shakespeare! Understood? We all nodded acquiescingly while I felt more than ever a near desperate need to urinate. And then, mysteriously, Headmaster Ravel produced, seemingly from thin air, a book of the complete works of William Shakespeare. Uh, it was the first time that I, and I suppose most of my tiny fellows, had ever seen a complete works of Shakespeare. Headmaster Ravel, with a strength belying his slim muscle structure, held the enormous book out toward us and cried in near ecstasy, This is a book of the complete works of the genius William Shakespeare. You will read and appreciate each and every one of its glorious, awe-inspiring pages. All of them. There was an audible gasp from myself and my fellows, for this book seemed to be the size of an enormous North Country estate. It, it was bigger than a castle, more frightening in size and implication than a herd of rampaging elephants. It was gargantuan and obviously filled with millions and millions of pages containing no doubt billions and billions of obscure unpronounceable and totally unwished for words. Uh, the book, in fact, seemed to defy physics, for it appeared to us all in some inexplicable way to be too large to fit into the classroom, let alone be held by the comparatively frail-looking headmaster Ravel. I swear, I could see smoke and fire emanating from the pages of this darkly magical pyramid-sized tome of letters, as if giant nightmare-inspiring creatures of yore with large green scales and multiple eyes were living inside its pages, waiting with razor-sharp teeth and oceans of brownish drool to devour anyone so foolish as to open it. All of the book's dangers seem lost on Headmaster Ravel, who fairly petted the ugly album as one might a puppy in the park. He stroked that threatening text with the long, sensuous finger dance that Don Juan no doubt used so successfully on many an unsuspecting maiden. Indeed, there was something, uh, well, almost disgustingly sexual about Headmaster Ravel, Ravel's way with this, to our way of thinking, monstrously malignant manual. He paused for a full five minutes, eyes closed, Breathing altered to little nasty gasp of pleasure as he, as he, well, as he seduced the book to opening. 
bare and engorged they stood before us these naked pages burning somehow with a sort of pleonastic sexuality eroticum vedamicum and then he placed the voluminous volume on the floor and prostrated himself in front of it like Mary at the Holy Cross beneath the dying Jesus like Prospero before his magic book and then he puckered his oldish lips and kissed ever so gently this ominous opus of doom spread like a diseased whore on the bed of the classroom floor before us no sooner had his pursed lips touched the perverted pages then he leapt from the floor and launched into the first of what was to be for me over the next two years an endless barrage of Shakespearean monologues. But he, uh, he wasn't bad either. You for the muse of fire that would ascend the brightest heaven of invention, a kingdom for a stage, princes to act, and monarchs to behold the swelling scene. But pardon, gentles all, the flat, unraised spirits that have dared on
on this unworthy scaffold bring forth so great an object pardon and let us on your imaginary forces work piece out our imperfections with your thoughts into a thousand parts divide one man and make imaginary puissance think when we talk of horses that you see them printing their proud hooves in the receiving earth what is your thoughts alone that now must deck our king and send our hero jumping to and fro o'er time, turning the accomplishments of many years into an hourglass? For the which supply, admit me chorus to this history, who prologue like your humble patience pray, gently to hear and kindly to judge. How a pray! You may while observing a certain theatrical decorum of reserve, applaud me. Now, my young masters, all my brilliant blank pages, you are ready to be written upon by the dual efforts of the genius Billy Shakespeare and his uh, humble, though ever industrious compatriot in lyric lessons, yours truly, Clive T. Rivell. The T, of course, stood for theatrical. All right, all right, enough frivolity. Let us return to, and with the requisite dignity with which one must always approach him, the King Bard. And then, and then, that which each of us students in the individual cocoons of our terror most feared happened. For the unstoppable Clive T. Rebel, the T now stood for torturer, leaned forward and with the grim and ghastly grin of a Tyrannosaurus Rex insisted, One of you will now read to all of us a Shakespearean monologue. And before any of us had the time or good sense to run screaming out of the dense classroom into the comparative clarity of the London fog, Headmaster Rebel, who seemed now to have uh, transformed into some kind of gigantic, deadly, slimy viper. Headmaster Ravel slithered his horrible way toward me and whispered the poetic poison dripping in insinuating paralyzing droplets from his enormous snaky fangs. Master Graves! I looked up despairingly into the fatal eyes of the viperous headmaster and like a condemned man extended my neck in tragic swan-like fashion so as to make the death bite as quick and painless as possible just get it over with quick please i thought and then headmaster clive t Ravel, the t now stood for terminal struck and bit deeply and without mitigation into my sad resolved and infinitely innocent neck by saying master graves you will now read to the rest of the class. <laughs> A Shakespeare monologue. Now, I have heard from people who claim to know such things that when a man lost on the polar ice cap after hours of bitter, inescapable freezing finally gives up and lies down in the snow, he gets warm. It was, I think, something like that that happened to little six-year-old me that day for I don't remember being afraid anymore. I don't remember getting up from my desk. I don't remember walking to the front of the class. I don't remember how the complete works of Shakespeare got into my hands, how the particular monologue was chosen, or even turning the pages to find it. But still I read, um, rather brokenly, but not badly, Orlando's opening speech from As You Like It. As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion, and then I came to the next word, and I pronounced the next word, bequeathed. And I could hear Headmaster Rebel from somewhere over my right shoulder gently admonishing me, bequeathed. What? I said. The word, Master Graves, the word is bequeathed. Now read it again. So I did. As I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will. Now this time, Headmaster Rebel corrected me somewhat more sternly, but still with a firm civility at least. Bequeathed. 
bequeath Ed. Now, read it again, young man, and this time acknowledge, please, the meter. Bequeath Ed. I turned and was astonished to see on the faces of my classmates that they now appeared very interested in what was happening to me. They were not, as they had seen before, sympathetic but relieved. No, now they appeared eager to watch what was irrevocably happening to me. They, they sensed an impending spectacle, something dreadful but infinitely enjoyable from the comparative safety of their desk. Good God, they seem now like Romans at the Colosseum. And I, a poor, bound Christian stadium center, waiting for the clawing final attack of Headmaster Ravel, the execution of Lion, everything came back at once into a blinding focus of the grim, nasty reality of my situation. And I suddenly needed to pee more than I have ever needed to
reality in my life. Master Graves, we are waiting! Oh, the complete works was once again overwhelmingly huge. My little arms and hands trembled under the weight of it. My whole body shook. I began to sweat. I wasn't sure I could read, wasn't sure I could even breathe. My throat was as dry as the Sahara, and a strange and inexplicable taste of rancid butter came into my mouth. Master Graves, we are waiting! So I tried. <laughs> as I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion... B b I paused before the deadly word. It wouldn't seem to come. Headmaster Rebel edged in close. I could feel his hot breath on the back of my neck. I glanced at my classmates, who seemed to lean forward as one from their desks, like people who go to automobile races and pray to see a car crash. The anticipation was, by all of us was exquisite. And then another shift occurred in my tiny little psyche, and I thought, ah, I can do this. I can read this speech, and no one, not Headmaster Clive T. Revell, not my classmates, not the Prime Minister, not God himself, can make me pronounce the word bequeathed as bequeathed. And I became inspired by the sheer aloneness of my situation. I became, I became... I became the one thing one should never, ever, ever become in a British boys' school in London in 1960. I became defiant. And I felt for the moment, and indeed the moment was most short-lived, but for the moment I felt stronger than the rest and ready to do linguistic battle with the world. And so I read, sponsored by my newfound defiance, as I remember, Adam, it was upon this fashion bequeathed me by will. I read with thunder and assurance and command. I read with perfect and perfectly challenging defiance. Well, to put it mildly, I almost immediately regretted my brazen resolve, for no sooner had Bequeath crossed my insubordinate lips than Headmaster Rebel, accompanied by the wide-eyed looks of terrified disbelief of my classmates, Headmaster Rebel leapt in front of me, his hands gesticulating madly, his whole body trembling with anger at my effrontery, and screwing his face into incredible paroxysms of contort and slobbering like a mad dog, he began to scream, Bequeath it! Be Bequeathed! Bequeathed! You stupid, little, insolent, rebellious, obnoxious, unteachable puke! You must observe the meter! The meter! The meter! You must never forget the goddamned iambic pentameter in Shakespeare! I immediately lost all sense of defiance, lost all sense of worth as a person, and worst of all, lost complete control of my bladder. And there, in front of God, my classmates, and the still leapingly mad Headmaster Ravel, I wet my pants. <laughs> I drenched my pants. I urinated like a proverbial racehorse. My trousers were inundated, and a huge and widening yellow puddle surrounded and expanded around my damp shoes as the class grew stony silent. And then, my overwhelmingly embarrassed hands dropped the complete works of William Shakespeare. And I swear, when the bard hit the floor, he splashed like a rock in a pond, so much had I peed. Headmaster R Ravel glared at me with a look of stunned disbelief. And then I thought I saw a look of kindness come across his crazy face. I thought I saw compassion creeping into the eyes of this dictator of diction, but just as quickly that look disappeared, for my formerly appalled classmates now began to giggle and then to laugh uncontrollably. Headmaster Ravel spun fiercely on them. Quiet! There was instant silence. And then he stood up, and straightening himself, he said with a calm, devoid of anything remotely resembling human understanding, Master Graves, I believe you have pissed yourself before you subject me, your classmates, and Shakespeare himself to any such further humiliations. I order you to your room to bathe, reclothe, and return to class a hopefully less arrogant seeker of wisdom. 
I burst into tears and ran blindly back to my room, hating myself, my classmates, for reasons not entirely clear to me, hating also Orlando, the play, as you like it, and most of all, thoroughly despising Shakespeare. That's the beginning of my relationship with Shakespeare. Thanks for listening to it. So I hope you'll come uh, join us on uh, August 27th through September 1st at the Oriental Plaza Theater to see the rest of the story and how my relationship with that man ultimately really does transform my life. Thank you for letting me spend time with you.